itunya itunya kok gitu Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Before we are getting started, I want to check whether my voice is clear enough. Hello? Yes, we yes we can hear you. Right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. My name is Kristo Sagala, your Master of Ceremony for today's event. I am placed seven international public lecture host and organized by the Faculty of Law, Universitas Jember. The Honorable Vice Dean on Academic Affairs, Bapak Idewa I. Gede Widiana Suarda, PhD. Our distinguished speaker, Max Tewer, PhD. Moderator, Ibu Feni Triayunita. And of course, all participants of, of this public lecture. Once again, welcome. Before we start, at first, let us honor this meeting. With Indonesian national anthem and the followed by the hymn of Universitas Jember. Operator, please.
Thank you. Now we are going to the welcoming remarks that will be delivered by the vice dean, which will also officially open this event. Bapak Ikede Widiana Suarda, PhD, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much for the master of ceremony. Can you hear me, the master of ceremony, Bang Christo? Yes, sir. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, selamat siang. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, Salam Rahayu untuk kita semuanya. The Honorable Max Tour, uh, PhD from Jindal Global Law School. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for uh, having here with us today. And also the Honorable Vice Deans, lectures, students, and all participants of uh, this seventh international public lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, on behalf of the Dean, Professor Bayu, I would like to express my gratitude for the presence of Max at this uh, international public lecture. It is a luxury having you here with us today and also my warmest welcome for the participants. It is my honor to welcome all of you in this uh, seven international public lectures. This remark uh, supposed to be delivered by the Dean. Unfortunately, he has an urgent meeting at the very last moment in Jakarta. So he asked me to, uh, to give a, a opening speech in the seven international public lecture. Anyway, uh, the Dean sends his regard to all of you. He said that uh, especially to Max, he was your respondent at the last year's ICCIS conference, I think in Denpasar in, in Bali. Is that right, Max? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to introduce a, a very brief about our university, especially to Max, and of, of course, to all the participants in this uh, international public lecture. Uh, university of Chamber is a public university located in East Java. We have uh, 15 faculties throughout the uh, university with no less than 40,000 students. 2,500 among them are students from the Faculty of Law, uh, which is now uh, some of them are participated in this uh, seven international uh, public lecture. According to uh, 2022 Simago institution ranking, uh, the University of Chamber is ranked 13th uh, best university in Indonesia and ranked 646 globally. It's quite, uh, uh, it's quite interesting because is, you know, the rank is quite good in the last two, three years. So it's quite good for the university reputation uh, globally. Now let me introduce this international public lecture program, which is hosted and organized by the Law Faculty University of uh, Jember. The international public lecture, which is uh, commonly called IPL, has been hosted and organized uh, regularly uh, since the last two years. So this is the seven uh, IPL from uh, I think 2020-21 we started and now it's the seven IPL, which is uh, quite interesting with Max here with us today. This series of uh, international lectures was intended to encourage the faculty members to be actively engaged with um, international discourses, as well as scholars and academics throughout the world to earn insights uh, from experts across the globe as well. Absolutely, we, we would like to encourage our lectures, students, 
to engage actively with scholars uh, throughout the world, globally as well, with the current issue of facing the world nowadays. Uh, finally, once again, I would like to thank our honorable speaker, Max Tur from Jindal Global Law School. Thank you also to the Master of Ceremony, the moderator, of course, the participants and all the committee members for preparing this uh, very well event. And may you have a healthy and fruitful discussion. And I do believe Max will, uh, you know, deliver uh, an interesting, uh, in an interesting um, topic and in, in, in interesting issues because uh, I, I see the uh, PowerPoint delivered to me by the, uh, by the committee. I've read through the materials and this is quite exciting topics. Max will guide you from uh, Hannah Heron's political thought to the classical debate between Hans Kelsen and Carl Smith as well. A company with a rich historical context, it's very interesting and informative topic. I believe that participant uh, will gain a lot of insight from his uh, lecture. Once again, may you have a, a fruitful discussion and a healthy discussion with Max. And by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I declare the seventh international public lecture is officially open. Thank you very much. And once again to Max, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming along today to be our uh, speaker for the seven international public lecture. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the speech, Bapak Igede Widian Swarda, PhD. Now we move to the prayer session that will be guided by Bapak Fiska Molidia Nugroho. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kristo Sangkala. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, swastiastu, nam budaya, salam kebajikan, salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Please, at noon today, with all due respect, allow me to lead and deliver this EPL 7 event through prayer, so that the event can run well and be successful. So. Simultaneously, prayer will be done in Islamic ways. Prayer begins. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wal'akibatu lil muttaqin. Wala udwana illa ala al-dhalimin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil amna ila mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rasa. Rabbana dolamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana ku nana minal khasirin. Rabbana atina fit dunya hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanah wa qina anda bilna. Wa sallallahu ala shaydina Muhammadin nabiyil umi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa katika wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil isyadi al-mul sifun. Wa sallamun ala al-mursalin. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil alam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. So prayer the reading process and has been said. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi Santi Om Shalom. And please, Mr. Christopher Sagal. Thank you, Mr. Fiska Muladian Nugroho. Then we move to the main agenda of today's event. Ibu Feni Triayonita will be our moderator. From now on, <coughs> Ibu Feni and Max, the time is yours. Okay, uh, can you hear me all? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the stage, Mr. Cristo as Master of Ceremony. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
Good afternoon and good morning to all audience. Uh, the Honorable Dean Faculty of Law University of Jember and the Honorable Vice Dean uh, Wan, Faculty of Law University of Jember, the Honorable our speaker of this event from Jinder Law School, and the Honorable our lecturer and participant who have been engaged in this in this event. Um, it is such an honor for me for being a moderator on this public lecture. And first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Fanny Tria Yunita, and I am a lecturer on the Constitutional Law Department, uh, Faculty of the University of Jember. And today, I will lead our discussion in this current event uh, at the seventh International Public Lecture. So. Um, this is an annual public lecture that has been uh, held three times in a year, and we already have the uh, seventh series today. And uh, but this series will be a uh, fascinating, introduce a fascinating topic about a constitutional court and democracy, which uh, was being an outstanding topic in Indonesia in recent years. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we are going too far for the discussion, please welcome our uh, special speaker today, uh, Max Toyer, PhD. Uh, good morning, Max. I'm glad to see you on this meeting and thank you for your time for being speaker here. Um, before we are going to the main agenda, let me introduce our speaker today. Um, Max Toyer, PhD. He is an assistant professor on Jindal Law School from Jindal Global University. Uh, his work uses on democracy, constitutional education, uh, constitutional court, freedom of expression, and constitutionalism in Europe. And he is graduated on bachelor degree in Comenius University, Slovakia, and he's graduated on Master of Law from University of Cambridge and Master of Arts on Central European University. Uh, he's also created PhD from Communist University of Slovakia. And here uh, I see that he has a lot of experience in research uh, as a researcher. Uh, uh, he has so uh, many publications, scholarship and award. Some of them are scholarship from the Tatra Bank Foundation for a uh, formal research stay on constitutional court, uh, the guardian of democracy at the University of Oxford, um, Fulbright Scholarship for Graduate Studies, and the honorable mention of the interdisciplinary studies section. And he is also a member of a uh, Helsinki Committee for Human Rights in Slovakia. And he is also the member of the founding advisory board on the Central and uh, Eastern European chapter. So uh, before we give the stage for the speaker, I generally reminder for all participants, uh, for all participants that we will have some uh, time for question and comment at the end of the presentation. As participation, of course, uh, you can take a, a question, share your thought, and present any debatable argument after the discussion. Uh, but along the presentation, if you want to more explanation about the topic, you can mention your question by uh, forum chat directly. So uh, this is uh, this forum is meant to be an attractive discussion, so don't hesitate to contribute with uh, your insights here. Okay, uh, without any further ado, I will I would like to welcome our presenter today to start the presentation. For Max, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Selamat Siam, Honorable Vice Dean Vidyana Suarda, uh, dear participants, uh, dear Fanny Unita, it's been a great honor to be invited to this uh, lecture and to have this opportunity uh, to meet with all of you virtually. Uh, I'm connecting to you from Slovakia in, in, in Central Europe, uh, and uh, it's the morning time, and also to learn a little bit more um, about the University of uh, Jember. And special thanks to Rian for all his work in preparing uh, this uh, lecture and this session, and of, of course, also uh, the rest of the team. So let me try to share uh, my screen, which I hope uh, will work. And of course, uh, thanks to 
Rian and the committee who have already may have had access to uh, the slides uh, that uh, I have shared uh, before this talk. Um, and indeed, uh, as mentioned, uh, the topic that I would like to introduce to you uh, today, and it is really going to be an introduction because it is a very rich, um, a very um, extensive uh, topic. So um, it will only be possible to share a, a few remarks, but it's on the relationship between constitutional courts uh, and democracy. Um, so I will start by, you know, saying just a few more words on my background, and I already was very kindly and, and generously uh, introduced by um, uh, Ms. Penny uh, Unita. Um, but I would like to stress uh, in terms of the kind of methodological or also conceptual background that I'm coming to you, and this is because this may influence uh, the way how I present uh, some ideas to you. And this is also something that uh, you may notice, you know, in your classes, but also beyond if you attend uh, academic events, if you read academic publications, um, that the perspective uh, that the authors or speakers are coming from will influence uh, their arguments. And even before that, uh, I would just like to underscore that I really look forward uh, to your questions, to your thoughts, reflections, critiques uh, that may arise. So please don't hesitate uh, to put these into the chat during the uh, talk. Um, I uh, will try to check, and if not, then definitely at the end um, of these introductory remarks, uh, we uh, would have time uh, to address them. Um, so my background is interdisciplinary, um, which means uh, that I try to combine insights from different disciplines. In my case, it is mainly law, legal studies, and political science, but of course, many other combinations uh, could be envisioned. And I think this is particularly useful when studying a phenomenon such as constitutional courts, which are very much um, at the intersection of interest of different disciplines. So it is not only a subject that is essential for legal studies, and I understand most of uh, you here in the audience are law students, uh, but what is also important for political scientists, for sociologists, uh, for even ethnologists, for anthropologists, and many other uh, disciplines. Uh, and in addition to that interdisciplinary scope, I try to uh, focus more broadly on the relationship between law and politics. And I want to be very clear from the start about my understanding of this relationship, broadly speaking. So I'm supporting and I'm working in the field, in the tradition, which sees law and politics as inherently intertwined, meaning that there is a necessary connection between law and politics. You cannot separate uh, law and politics. There are arguments and perspectives that say you can separate law and politics. So my background comes from this perspective, which says they are inherently uh, intertwined. And, and Rian kindly mentioned Hannah Arendt before, indeed, uh, you can see uh, on, the, on the picture, if you have access to the uh, slides, uh, a, a philosopher, uh, very well known, uh, who has worked, among others, on the relationship uh, between law and politics and the very understanding of politics. And she provides what I think is a helpful way uh, to think about politics as an inherent mechanism uh, for achieving freedom. So in a broad sense, if we enter the public sphere, and even this call, this meeting, uh, this, this session is in a sense a public sphere, uh, we are engaging in some sort of discourse, in some sort of deliberation, and that represents in a certain sense politics. Now this, however, is different from uh, politics in a narrow sense, understood uh, as I could say partisanship or partisan politic, politics, um, which is more about a struggle for attaining governmental power. And it is also very important in a democracy, but it is a narrower understanding of politics. So in that sense, law can be separated from partisan politics, but cannot be separated from politics um, more broadly. And this is also something we can, we can discuss, but I'm just flagging this before even getting uh, to the main uh, two concepts and ideas uh, of today's talk, which is constitutional courts and democracy, uh, so that we have a little bit of a background here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm connecting to you from Slovakia. This is a country uh, in Central Europe, 
Uh, it is a country that has been um, part of the so-called communist bloc uh, for over 40 years. Um, this country has been under the rule of a non-democratic state socialist regime. And after 1989, uh, so a, a bit more uh, than 30 years ago, uh, now uh, it has attained um, uh, independence uh, and um, uh, has embarked on a democratic uh, transition. Uh, now, Slovakia is also part of several other regional groupings in Europe, which you may have heard of, one of them being the European Union. The European Union is an association that brings together 27 of European states, and Slovakia is one of these, uh, one of these states, um, but there are also big differences between uh, the states in the European Union, particularly one divide that is being listed is between the West and the East, right? So the West uh, being the countries that have democratized, that have embarked on a transition towards democracy from uh, an earlier time after the Second World War, even from before. And then you have uh, the East, which in this sense also encompasses Central Europe. It can be a little bit uh, confusing, um, which has uh, had a, a much longer non-democratic, or we could also say authoritarian um, uh, history, authoritarian legacy. And so in that sense, uh, there is a, a divide also uh, within, within Europe, and perhaps we could say uh, within the West uh, more broadly. And precisely because of this um, divide and, and this existence of the non-democratic legacies, I think it is very important and valuable in, in that sense also this uh, meeting with you is a learning opportunity for me um, uh, to explore parallels between developments in a region such as Central Europe, including Slovakia, but other countries in the region as well, and then uh, countries outside Europe, uh, which may have had very different experiences on the one hand, but also may have shared uh, some similarities, for example, when it comes to the transition towards democracy and the challenges associated with the transition towards a democratic uh, regime. And there definitely India, which is uh, the, the, the country where one of my academic institutions is based at, the Jindal uh, Global Law School, as well as Indonesia, could be very important um, uh, countries to perhaps compare and, and engage with also from the perspective of Central Europe, which is the perspective uh, that I come from. So that was just a little bit uh, on, on the background of where I'm coming from, my position uh, in, in this talk and in the discussion with you. What I will try to do in the next about uh, 20 minutes um, is to very briefly uh, try to introduce to you this concept and idea of constitutional courts. And I'm sure that uh, this is something that many of you uh, are, are very familiar with, so it may be you know, something that uh, you already know, but just to be uh, on uh, the same page. After this, I would again do a very short uh, introduction of the notion and concept of democracy, right? So constitutional courts first, uh, then uh, democracy, because these are essential building blocks uh, for uh, the key claim that I'm trying to, uh, I will try to suggest to you and I will try to introduce to you uh, on that when we study constitutional courts, it is essential to study them in relation to democracy, that this relationship between democracy and constitutional courts is a very important one uh, to look at, and perhaps one that is not being looked at that much as it could be in legal studies, in political science, in broader uh, debate, uh, including debate about constitutional courts. Um, and after this, understanding of the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy, um, I will try to uh, share with you my main claim in this debate, my main argument, which of course you are very free to challenge, which is that constitutional courts need to engage with democracy and they need to engage with democracy in a particular way. And this is what I will try to argue uh, in this talk and then conclude with a few maybe remarks and questions to you also on how to think about the future of constitutional uh, courts. And uh, indeed, I, I think um, Indonesia is an excellent jurisdiction to actually study and discuss this question because of the constitutional court uh, that you have. And I understand uh, that at the University of Jemba recently you had uh, the visit of the vice uh, chair, vice president uh, of the Indonesian uh, constitutional court. And this is also a very important um, point, point of reference, this engagement directly with 
uh, the constitutional court in your jurisdiction, but also with constitutional courts in other uh, jurisdictions um, globally. So I'm moving on uh, with the slides and do let me know if uh, there is any problem with uh, the, the changing of the slides or uh, with, with uh, my voice. Um, so the first point, constitutional courts. Why focus on constitutional courts? This may be kind of talking to the convinced here, because uh, if the audience is based mainly on, on law students, of course, law students are often uh, already interested in constitutional courts. But still, just to um, be on the, on the same page. So constitutional courts are a particular type uh, of court, a particular type of adjudicative political institution, uh, as some scholars would, uh, would put it, uh, which, uh, however, are based on, in, in the foundational sense, on the same logic as any other court, uh, which is resolving disputes, right? So there are some disputes that may emerge in the society and there is need uh, for a third party, for some kind of actor uh, who will authoritatively, uh, meaning with authority, um, with uh, backing, with support, um, will resolve that particular dispute. Contemporary societies, um, tend to face more of these disputes uh, because of growing complexities. At least this is what you know, many scholars would argue. This means that there is more space, more role for courts uh, to engage in resolving those disputes. Now, this applies to all courts in a sense, you could, you could say. But then we have constitutional courts emerging in order to address disputes that are particularly challenging, difficult, um, and particularly overarching in the society, you could say, right? So they strike at the heart of the functioning of that given society. This may be questions of elections. This may be questions of fundamental rights. This may be um, questions of the organization of governmental power. How are we being ruled? How ought we uh, be ruled? So these types of questions often reach the constitutional courts. Uh, in particular. Um, and again, because of the growing number of disputes also in this area, there has been an argument made in the, in the literature, and it is very prominent now, and many of you know, know this well, of the judicialization of politics. So uh, political foundational issues of the organization of the society um, are becoming transferred to the courts. Courts are becoming a central forum for addressing, for resolving these disputes, for providing some authoritative responses to these questions, right? So judicialization of politics, Ron Herschel is a scholar who has been uh, very uh, well known for, with, with, with this claim, although he has not been the one who coined uh, this, uh, this claim. Okay? So this is where constitutional courts come in. A dedicated institution that is there to address these fundamental questions um, of the polity, which also often trigger disputes between uh, segments of the society, um, between governmental actors um, and um, uh, holders of, of political power uh, in the state. Now, constitutional courts are a fascinating institution also uh, because they can possess a very wide range of powers and they come in actually very different shapes and shades all around the world. Now, we don't have time in this talk to really go into the history um, uh, and the evolution of, of constitutional uh, adjudication into what we can know as the generations of constitutional courts. Um, you can find a little bit more about this in the slides, but I will not uh, you know, go into that now. We can discuss in the Q&A if you are interested in some of these particular aspects. But just very briefly to highlight that the constitutional court's powers are a very important point of reference when we are studying them. So what powers does the constitutional court have? What can it do? Uh, according to the constitution, sometimes there is, I understand also in Indonesia, an act on the constitutional court, or, or uh, there are some other um, pieces of legislation which are relevant for this. Now, typically, the kind of basic um, power that the constitutional court would, would have in most jurisdictions uh, would be that it can strike down legislation or quash legislation. These are terms that you may encounter um, when, when in discussions about constitutional courts, meaning it can declare that a piece of legislation or at least some provisions in legislation 
that has been enacted typically by parliament uh, has been uh, deemed incompatible with the constitution. Um, so there is something that is unconstitutional in the legislation. The constitution uh, prevails, legislation needs to uh, step back. However, this is only really the tip of the iceberg of the powers of the constitutional courts. And I would argue that it is important to focus on the range of other powers of the constitutional courts. I think if I'm not wrong, and I'm happy to be corrected on this point, um, is that the Indonesian constitutional court has four or five uh, key powers. Now, in some other jurisdictions, you have constitutional courts uh, with many more powers. So the Slovak constitutional court, which is one that I'm specializing on in my research, has 20 uh, competencies. It, it, can, it has 20 different competence areas uh, where it can uh, decide. Tom Ginsburg, another very well-known um, scholar of constitutional court, um, has called some of these powers to be ancillary. So they typically come in addition to the basic powers of constitutional review, uh, but they can be very significant uh, for addressing uh, some of these challenges. And all of these powers uh, raise uh, questions in concrete cases, uh, which also pertain uh, to the foundational concepts, notions of the polity, human rights, democracy, the rule of law, justice. Okay, uh, So these are very important points of reference for the constitutional courts. Now the question is, why democracy? Okay, So let me move, move on a, a little bit further uh, to the second point. So once we have this kind of basic picture on constitutional courts, so why study and think about constitutional courts, particularly in relation to democracy, and not, for example, in relation to human rights or rule of law or, or justice or, or something else, right? And these are all, of course, very important concepts. But the argument that I'm putting forward here in this talk, in this discussion with you, is that it is the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy that is of particular importance. So before moving on to that relationship, just a few words on democracy uh, as such. Democracy is a, an extremely complex concept, as I'm sure uh, you are aware of uh, as well. Uh, and there are many different readings uh, of democracy. I would like to suggest that kind of a starting point, how we can, one starting point, how we can think uh, about democracy is uh, what one scholar, Bastian Rikema uh, from, from the Netherlands, uh, called the possibility of self-correction. So democracy offers what any other political regime, what any other societal arrangement does not really offer. And that is, it, it gives a chance, it gives an opportunity to correct the mistakes that have been done. It gives an opportunity to reflect and it gives an opportunity um, that maybe in the future, if something has been done wrong, uh, the same actors or perhaps different actors who uh, will get uh, uh, to, to, to power, who will get to the positions to make decisions, um, will be able to rectify uh, those errors, right? So this mechanism of self-correction is an often overlooked feature uh, of, of democracy, but I think it is very useful to start with it because it also helps us understand when we look currently at the state of democracy globally, um, what um, we see is, well, we have a number of regimes uh, a number of jurisdictions, we could also say, uh, where democracy is on the decline. Uh, you can find a lot of different terms uh, in this regard. You can uh, hear about deterioration of democracy, about erosion of democracy, about deconsolidation of democracy, about decay of democracy. So all kinds of, of adjectives and, 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 and associations. But the logic essentially and the, the basic level uh, is the same, right? So we have uh, some development from democracy back towards some sort of authoritarian uh, regime. And uh, on the slides, those of you who can access them, um, there is a, a, an extract uh, from the latest report of the Varieties of Democracy Institute, which is an institute uh, that is um, charged with assessing the quality of democracy worldwide, one of, one of many. Uh, and it shows that there is a trend of rising autocratization, of deterioration of democracy. In a sense, there is a rising number of regimes uh, who do not permit this option for self-correction, who do not give this, because if you have an authoritarian regime, and this goes back to Hannah Arendt, then uh, you, you don't have a possibility for self-correction. The only possibility is the change of the, of the regime uh, in that case. OK, 
Okay. Uh, so this is a kind of foundational starting point for, for democracy, which may be a little bit different from maybe how you understand uh, democracy. And there is actually a, a poll um, that is part of the slides, and we can we can launch it if time allows later, um, where I'm asking you about, you know, think about what is your understanding of democracy? How would you define uh, democracy, right, in your own uh, time and in your own space and in the context uh, in which uh, in which you are based? So here I'm proposing uh, one, one understanding, which is, I think, then useful to think about the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy, because constitutional courts are, in a sense, a key institution in this mechanism of self-correction. What does a constitutional court do? It can say, well, Parliament, you have adopted a piece of legislation, but this piece of legislation is contrary to some foundational provision in our constitution. Therefore, it is unconstitutional. Therefore, it has to be struck down. You have to correct it. Right? Often there is even a, a direct command to the, uh, to the parliament to correct the piece of legislation. This depends on the, on the jurisdiction, the specifics of the process. But the logic of self-correction is very much at the foundation of justifying why do we have an institution uh, such as the constitutional uh, court. The Weistein uh, very kindly mentioned in his introductory remarks that I would talk about the Kelsen Schmidt debate. For the sake of time, I will not uh, do that in any detail. Just I will refer very briefly uh, that this debate between you know two scholars, German scholars um, of of the nineteen uh, of the twentieth century, early twentieth century, um, who have been really this in disagreement of about how to protect the constitution and in a sense how to protect uh, democracy. Uh, and uh, their disagreement has very much shaped the emergence of constitutional courts because Hans Kelsen was uh, a proponent of an institution such as the constitutional court. And actually Hans Kelsen has been born in, in Prague, which was uh, the capital of a state known as Czechoslovakia, of which Slovakia was, was part of. So uh, this region where uh, I'm based at currently is, is very much at the origin of that debate. But that, of course, doesn't mean uh, that this debate is enough for us to understand constitutional courts. And in fact, uh, if we were to really look at the, the history, which I mentioned, I will, I will not uh, have time to do uh, in this talk, we would actually find uh, a number of generations, a number of moves, um, um, uh, ex ex um, uh, extensions uh, of constitutional review around the world. And not just extensions, but also transformations um, of this institution when it moved into, into other contexts, including Southeast Asia, including uh, Latin, uh, Latin America. And I think now, nowadays it is extremely important to actually look more uh, into those regions and into constitutional courts, such as uh, Indonesia, in, the, in a sense also the Indian Supreme Court, although that one operates um, on a little bit, uh, little bit different basis. Okay, uh, so Paul, we can keep for, for later. Uh, but now I would like to move to the third point, now that we have this basis um, of constitutional courts and, and democracy, of why and how to think about the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy. Okay. So I already mentioned um, that this idea of democracy as self-correction uh, can give us a, a very good entry point into understanding the rationale of constitutional courts, because constitutional courts can provide this correction uh, for a political regime that aspires to be uh, a democracy. However, there is more to that if we were to, to unpack uh, the discussion, also because um, these readings of democracy are very different that you can find in various jurisdictions, in the literature. Um, there is a, a thousands of years old political theory of democracy. You could say the origin of democracy was actually uh, in, in, in Asia, actually in India, um, uh, there has, have been earlier discussions about democracy than in ancient Greece, which is the typical point of reference about democracy. So, of course, we don't have time to go through all of that in the talk. But what I would like to suggest uh, is that for this study of relationship between constitutional courts and democracy, it is useful to sort of develop uh, certain conceptions of democracy. So we had this basic idea, democracy is self-correction. But then even within that, there, are, there is a range of ways how that self-correction process may operate. Okay. And on the slide that I have up now, and I, I hope uh, some of you can, can access it, uh, there are three different conceptions. 
um, that um, uh, we can work with. And this is you know, one way that I'm suggesting, but there are others that we could, we could think. And this is the minimalist conceptions, the middle-ranged conceptions, and the maximalist conceptions. And the basic difference here is, in a sense, how much do we include into the concept of democracy? What do we include uh, into the concept of democracy? The minimalist conceptions essentially reduce democracy to elections, right? So democracy ultimately is about elections, is about political uh, competition, okay? So here um, you have a definition by Joseph Schumpeter, a, a political theorist, of democracy as that institutional method for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. You see, vote, so elections. That is the central foundation, the central feature of democracy, and essentially that is enough for democracy. However, there are other conceptions which come in. It say, no, it is not enough to just have elections for a democracy. Right? And this goes back to my invitation to you to think about you know, what, what is your understanding of democracy? What would you say democracy is? Okay. Um, because these are alternative understandings to the minimalist conceptions, known as middle-ranged or maximalist conceptions, say, no, elections is important, but there is something else that is needed. Middle-range conceptions would say uh, you need at least some guarantees of civil and political rights, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, personal rights, um, right to privacy, right? freedom of movement, some basic civil and political rights, at least you need, right? You may also need um, horizontal accountability, which is just a, a different term in a sense for separation of powers, right? For there being different institutions, that can provide uh, supervision of each other. Okay. And then uh, you may also need some power to govern. You may also need the, the capacity for the political uh, actors who have been elected uh, to actually deliver um, uh, some, some decision. Okay. And then we have even beyond these conceptions, we have the maximalist conceptions, which also focus on what democracy um, or to deliver, right? So if you if you define something as democracy, you, you bring expectations that it will deliver. It will deliver certain outputs, right? It will improve human well-being. It will improve substantive equity, right? Perhaps it will even bring justice, okay? That is a very uh, broad uh, debate, as you, may, as you may imagine, okay? But we will focus less on the maximalist conceptions. Those are uh, very challenging to engage with uh, in themselves, but I'm just inviting you to think about this question on, on democracy. And that is also what one of those core questions would, uh, would, would engage with. Um, now, I would, however, like to emphasize this distinction between the minimalist and the middle-ranged conceptions, right? So number one and number two, and this is because they are very useful, I would say, to understand the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy. Okay. And here comes the key point, the key argument uh, that, that I'm making that is kind of less of an introduction to uh, some debates that are uh, going on than, uh, than you know, what my work or where my work is situated. And this is that, well, if we, if we think about it, minimalist democracy is virtually impossible to square with constitutional review, with constitutional courts, essentially. So if you understand democracy as requiring elections only, as requiring competitive struggle for the people's vote, as Schumpeter would put it, you don't really have any dedicated space for constitutional courts. And if this reading of democracy becomes dominant, the position of constitutional courts in the given jurisdiction, in the given society, in the given system, becomes very difficult to sustain. It becomes very difficult for them to actually be able to carry out uh, their, their role, their mission, okay, to, to, to conduct their competencies, which we have discussed before. However, if you adopt the middle-ranged conception of democracy, where you have also requirements of fundamental rights associated, linked to democracy as necessary features of democracy, where you also have some standards of separation of power, some standards of accountability, then there is a distinct role for constitutional now, the problem that comes in is 
that very frequently the minimalist readings of democracy are actually dominant in societies um, and also in the readings of political institutions, which paradoxically include constitutional courts. Constitutional courts themselves often embrace minimalist democracy. They embrace an understanding of democracy, which is, well, it is essentially about elections only. Okay. Now, that is not to say that constitutional courts would not deal with human rights or would not deal with separation of powers. Of course, they, they do. They address all of those uh, questions in their, their case law very often. But they don't address these questions in relation to democracy. And they themselves often tend, and this comes from my research on Central European constitutional courts, so I'm open to you know, other arguments being said that this is not the case with, with courts outside maybe Central Europe. But from the evidence that I have from Central Europe in particular and some limited evidence from some other courts, this is the typical the default. Okay? Constitutional courts themselves embrace this reading of democracy as elections only. Now that poses a number of problems by extension because in this way, constitutional courts open themselves up to be vulnerable to be vulnerable to challenges that say, well, why do we even have a constitutional court? Or, well, if we have a constitutional court, it should have a really limited jurisdiction. It should have a really limited set of competencies. Perhaps it should adjudicate some claims on the fairness of, of elections. Um, perhaps uh, occasionally adjudge some issues of, of legislation and its compatibility with, cons with constitutions. But that's it. Okay. So in this way, if the constitutional court embraces minimalist democracy, and more broadly, the society embraces minimalist democracy, it disempowers itself, right? And if it disempowers itself, it becomes very difficult for constitutional court to fulfill its constitutional mission, okay? Which is to uh, make sure that the constitution is upheld and by extension, uh, that democracy is upheld, okay? So it becomes very difficult for it essentially to do its job Right? Yet, constitutional courts very often embrace this minimalist reading. Why do they do that? There is a number of explanations that can be offered, and that could be for, for, for a later debate. Um, but this is a key point that I would like to suggest to you, and I would also be very interested in you know, hearing maybe some reflections or some questions associated in this sense uh, with the Indonesian case. Would this also apply uh, in, the, in the Indonesian Case. It does apply in some Central European cases where, for example, the Hungarian uh, Constitutional Court, and Hungary is one of those jurisdictions um, which is currently, I, I showed you these charts on the decline of democracy and the rise of autocratization before, and the Hungarian court is one of those courts which exists in this, this kind of regime, uh, a regime that is undergoing the transformation uh, towards an autocracy, right, which is undergoing a deterioration or erosion or decline, depending on which term you prefer, of democracy. And the Hungarian Constitutional Court itself, even before this process has started, has embraced a reading of democracy. The democracy is more or less elections. Okay? Democracy is not linked to human rights. Democracy is not linked uh, to uh, the separation of powers. These are very important say the judges or said the judges of the Hungarian Constitutional Court at that time, but they are not uh, linked to democracy. Okay? They are separate domains, separate issues, principles. And in this way, the Hungarian Constitutional Court judges open themselves up uh, to be disempowered then by the executive, which is what, what happened then when the the executive took over and, and it had adopted a new constitution even uh, in, in the country. Uh, and currently the Hungarian constitutional court is much weaker and it finds itself in a very, very difficult uh, position, right? So the building of the Hungarian constitutional court is the picture of the, on, on the left on the slide uh, now, right? So it finds itself in a very difficult position, much more than uh, the Slovak uh, court, which is the picture on the, of the building on the, on the right. Um, which I will not talk about in, in this sense now in detail. Um, but, you know, it's just an example how a constitutional court, in a sense, disempowered itself and prevented uh, its capacity to be effective in uh, 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 defending or, or, or protecting uh, democracy. Okay, so let me, let me wrap up uh, here and we can come back to some of the points that I 
left out from the slides uh, in the discussion. So I try to show you that we need and we benefit from studying the relationship between constitutional courts and democracy uh, in particular. Democracy is the concept that really um, brings up a lot of public discourse, a lot of, lot of debate, a lot of contestation, much more typically than rule of law or human rights. Okay, So in this way, the constitutional courts also become uh, much more embedded and much more closely present in the public discourse. And essentially, constitutional courts are public institutions as any other, so they need to be subject to public, uh, public discourse. So in this sense, we have constitutional courts and, and, and democracy. I try to show that, of course, we have different conceptions of democracy, but that certain conceptions of democracy are linked um, to the mission of constitutional courts more than others. In particular, the minimalist reading of democracy, which embraces uh, this kind of straightforward uh, link of, of democracy to elections only, is difficult to square, is difficult to be compatible with constitutional courts being an influential and relevant institution in the democratic regime. So constitutional courts, but also societies more broadly, and this pertains to academia, this pertains to, uh, to public discourse and, and academic discourse, may benefit from embracing conceptions of democracy that go beyond elections only, that go beyond, in a sense, the rule of the majority, and that bring in elements of human rights, the rule of law, separation of powers, as key features of democracy itself. Because that then gives rise to the justification of the rationale of uh, the existence of constitutional courts. Okay? Um, and of course, we can talk a lot about uh, how this speaks to the future developments of constitutional courts. On this final slide, I sort of gave you a few um, ideas that stem from recent debates in various academic fora, uh, public fora, uh, in the recent literature on you know, where um, issues of constitutional courts come up, including uh, the rise of skepticism, the rise of, of belief that, well, maybe we have put too much trust into constitutional courts. Maybe we should not focus on them that much. Okay? That's, a, that's a prominent trend in the literature. But what we can see and what I try to, to argue is that there is an alternative uh, to that reading, right? There is still a lot of reason, a lot of um, justification to focus on constitutional uh, courts. Uh, but I would argue it is very important then uh, to study constitutional courts alongside the study of democracy, alongside the study also of the future of, of democracy. And last but not least, to also care for the constitutional Courts, right? As citizens, as academics, um, as, as, as legal scholars, practitioners, um, uh, because uh, constitutional courts are part of the society. And so that kind of debate interaction between what we could say court insiders, so the people within the court, the judges, the clerks, the advisors who are really participating in the decision making process. And then uh, what we could say the court enthusiasts, the broader communities around the courts are essential for shaping the dynamics of the given constitutional court. And I am really impressed by how lively this debate is, or at least has been based on my limited encounters in Indonesia. Um, it is not really common uh, in many Central European countries to have this kind of broad engagement uh, between uh, 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 constitutional court judges and, and insiders, we could say, uh, and, uh, and the broader. Uh, public rights. So ultimately, it's also possibly an invitation uh, for you. I'm sure this is already the case with, with many of you here. Uh, but, uh, well, to scrutinize your constitutional court, perhaps also other constitutional courts in other jurisdictions use tools of comparison, um, but also to care for uh, the constitutional court, which is not to say to agree always with its decisions. Uh, I'm a, myself a harsh critic of many decisions of the Slovak constitutional court, um, but to, to study, to, to be attentive to what the judges say, uh, to uh, what the court tries to communicate. Uh, it's fascinating to, for example, look at the English website of the Indonesian Constitutional Court, uh, what it has to, uh, to, to communicate to the broader public. That says a lot about the institution uh, as well. Um, and uh, to um, reflect on uh, the role of constitutional courts uh, in democracy in uh, the state level, but also 
uh, globally. So I thank you very much. It's been a real privilege uh, to give these remarks and I really look forward uh, to your questions, critiques, uh, challenges uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Max, for your insightful presentation. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot from you today. So um, today we can see that this discussion is not just about a constitutional court as a governance institution, but also the strong relation with democracy and also the politics system. Um, before we are going to Q and A session, I thought that uh, you have some pull or any exercise for audience. Will it be held now or later? Oh, the poll. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned about this. Like to... Okay, sure. So let's. Yeah, we uh, have we have uh, we have uh, two hour um, around two hour for uh, this session. I think it's enough for you if you want to uh, get this poll. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Well, I'm just not sure whether, you know, everybody has the kind of infrastructure that is needed for that. So in that sense, you know, we can also um, keep it open. But the logic is basically that uh, you can scan this QR code, which I actually am very bad at doing. So uh, if someone is not uh, able to do that, then you are in kind of my team with that. Uh, but the other option is um, that you can also put in the URL, the, the link, you know, if you have like a browser. Uh, you have this wooklab.com and then you put in just uh, after a slash, you put in the event code. So those are the two uh, two options. And you have this um, QR code and this URL also in the slides that are available online. So what I would suggest that I will, I will do to spare um, uh, some time, uh, I will remove this now from the, from the screen, but you can find this in your uh, in the slides which are available online. So, so at any time you can go back there and I will share another screen, uh, which I hope will, uh, will work. Uh, and this one will allow us to actually move on from this you know, opening screen. You, you should hopefully now see the same QR code and URL. Can you see that? The QR code, uh, is that visible? Yeah, I already uh, tried the uh, QR code, but uh, I can't enter this. Uh, what is that website? Yeah, it needed uh, uh, to be uh, an email to log in into, into this website. That's that's interesting because uh, typically, you know, when I have my uh, students in India or in, in Slovakia, they can access it directly. So they just put in the QR code and they immediately get to the uh, to the web page. Now I see at this point we have like seven. Um, participants who have joined. But what I would suggest is, um, so I will just move on to the question because the question allows to be reflected on even without you know, having access to the, to the infrastructure. So um, I, I apologize if uh, this uh, particular app may not work well in um, Indonesia perhaps, but um, what I would suggest, so, so you can still access if you uh, use the QR code and if the technical infrastructure allows the QR code you can find on the slides online or you can put in the URL on the top of this uh, this screen, booklet.com, YYYTKJ. Um, but the question um, that is here is, is one I think you can also see on the slide. So you can reflect and think about this question uh, in your own time or, or maybe we can have a discussion here. And that is which of the following stands closest to your understanding of democracy, right? So I referred before uh, to this idea, well, um, think of how you understand democracy. What is your uh, conception of democracy? And I offered a few options, and I'm asking uh, which one is closest to how you understand it. So it may be that your understanding is not, you know, either of these five options, uh, which are now on the screen. Um, and if you manage to get into the system, you should also see them on your screen, on your phone, or, or, or your laptop computer. Uh, but um, one of them might be, you know, closer maybe than the others to what is your understanding. So it requires a little bit of thinking about you know, your understanding of democracy and then whether or which one of these approximates your understanding. So I just read out the options quickly and perhaps we can you know, just leave it also up and, and we, can, we can maybe take some other questions in the, in the meanwhile or as, you, as you prefer. So the first option is democracy is a political regime which respects the rule of law and fundamental rights. 
Then the second option says democracy is an ordering committed to achieving political and social equality. Third option says democracy is the rule of the people or the rule of the peoples. So both those options are here in number three. In number four, democracy is the rule of the majority. Okay. And in number five, democracy is a political regime characterized by regular, free, and fair elections. Okay, so five different uh, options, different understandings of democracy. You may have your own understanding, and one of these may be closer to that understanding uh, than others. So it's just something to think about, something we can discuss, but I'm also um, very happy and open to take you know, questions unrelated to, to this particular question here. Yeah, uh, maybe all participants, uh, all participants can try to open this uh, website. Uh, I I can uh, open this website already, and maybe uh, all participants can uh, uh, filling the answer while we are going to Q and A session. Yeah, it's right. Okay. Um, so the next session is Q and A. Um, let's open the floor for a question from the audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question or you can turn on your microphone directly to ask uh, the speaker or maybe you can add uh, or mention your question in the chat column in your Zoom. Okay, um, don't forget to mention your name and affili affiliation before asking your question here. So, did we already have some question? Yeah. Or maybe any debatable things that we can discuss about uh, this interesting topic? Uh, may I have the luxury to ask a question for Max? Okay, yeah, of course. Before we, uh, give the yeah, before we give the opportunity to the students. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, of course, Mr. Ian, you can yeah. uh, open the question. Yeah, yeah, Max, Max I, uh, I think this kind of uh, presentation, it reminded me uh, of what you, uh, you were presented in, in Bali uh, last year about the uh, uh, constitutional court in a declining uh, democracy. Uh, one question remains in, in my head about the debate of uh, the legitimacy. Because I think in most of the system of the constitutional court, uh, the judges are usually uh, not an elected officials. Uh, through the, uh, they are chosen uh, politically uh, by the executive, uh, legislative, uh, the parliament, and also by the supreme court. Usually, uh, in such a way, it means that they don't have uh, uh, what is it the, the sovereign the will of the people at their shoulder their legitimacy relies on the constitution itself so again this reminded me of the debate between uh, Kelsen and also Smith because uh, I think Smith is quite uh, for Indonesian uh, legal scholars Smith is uh, usually overlooked uh, we are more into 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 Carlson's uh, perspective, uh, but I think Smith is also important because he reminded us that uh, the question of legitimacy is important. So that's why he relies much on the uh, Reich president. Yeah. Oh, so and then it leads me to 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 uh, to the topic of of the judicial activism, whether whether uh, shall the the court is limited. Uh, how the court is limited uh, in, in, in granting uh, decisions, especially in a sensitive topics, because the, I, I, I do believe that they could not make a uh, decision uh, uh, in, uh, freely uh, because they are, because first they don't have uh, such kind of uh, political legitimacy in their soldier. So I, I just want to, I just want you to elaborate more on, on this kind of uh, legitimacy issues. Uh, sh shall I go ahead or shall we collect some? Yeah, yeah, you, you can uh, respond directly for this question. Sure, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Rian. Great, uh, great questions. Of course, uh, legitimacy is a, is a, is another major concept that uh, I haven't touched upon in the, in the, in the talk and that we can 
uh, engage with. And I, I think in a sense, you have already uh, provided a, a part of, of the answer or the answer that I would give to your question in, in your question, which is um, we have different readings of legitimacy. So one reading of legitimacy is, well, it is indeed based on elections. So um, you make decisions as a, as a political decision maker, whether it's president or executive or, or, or in the parliament, uh, by virtue of having been elected, right? You have succeeded in, uh, in elections. Um, so that's one conception of legitimacy. But then we have other conceptions of legitimacy. Right? And one of them you mentioned in the question is constitutional legitimacy, right? So what does the constitution say? Because the constitution is the foundational point of reference for the political community. And the constitution uh, is presumed to be legitimate. Now, there are also major questions around, around that, and we could get to debates on, on constitution, constituent power and, and the like. Uh, but assuming that the constitution is, is, is valid, uh, enjoys societal support, we could say broadly is legitimate. If the constitution says, we have a constitutional court, which is tasked with these and these roles, and very often you would find in constitutions, the constitutional court is tasked with protecting the constitution, or even is tasked with protecting uh, uh, democracy. In the Slovak constitution, you have it tasked with protecting constitutionality, um, right? Uh, so if you have this role for constitutional court embraced in the constitution, it is legitimate. The constitutional court is legitimate by that virtue, right? And we don't have to go back to elections um, for there to be a constitutional court. Now, there are many problems uh, there as well, which may raise with, for example, if um, the elections for some other offices, right? So, for example, for the parliament have not been free and fair. Again, this is partly in Hungary, right? In Hungary, there are no longer completely free and fair elections. And then if, which is the case in Hungary, the parliament appoints, as you mentioned, like the parliament is often one institution which appoints judges or at least some judges for the constitutional court, then is the constitutional court legitimate if it, the judges have been appointed by a parliament which has not been constituted through a free and fair elections, right? So there you may have problems with legitimacy of the constitutional court. But assuming this is not the case, um, then you can find the legitimacy, the source of legitimacy for the constitutional court in um, uh, the constitution, right? So not necessarily in uh, elections. And so this leads then to also the, the second question, which is on you know, judicial activism, which I have in the slides. That it's a problematic term. It's a, it's a loaded term, a term that is often used to actually curtail uh, the powers of, of constitutional uh, courts. And, and particularly when um, the origin point of understanding of constitutional courts is through electoral legitimacy. So essentially a minimalist reading of democracy, right? So democracy is the majority rule. Democracy is only about more or less elections, right? So if you have that source of origin for constitutional courts, then issues of activism. But if the constitutional court has legitimacy from and based on the constitution, then it indeed sometimes has to decide, arguably, on uh, also sensitive questions, if we understand sensitive questions being questions where issues of constitutional interpretation arise, right? What does the constitution actually say about the scope of freedom of speech, for instance, right? So which kinds of kind of speeches may be not permitted already uh, by the constitution and can be restricted, can even be prosecuted by criminal law in many jurisdictions, right? Just an, just an example, okay? So if we have that kind of um, uh, question, and if we have the constitutional court tasked to interpret that question by the constitution, then it is legitimate to interpret that question. But of course, it cannot do without then having some societal support for the outcomes of its interpretation, uh, for being um, taken, its decisions being taken up by other political actors, right? Such as um, the executive itself, but also the legislature and also the broader, broader community, court enthusiasts, court observers, right? If everybody rejects a decision of the constitutional court, this is a wrong decision. This is a decision which we will disregard. The constitutional court cannot do anything. Okay, so it needs also this societal engagement. So when I say, yes, the constitutional court can decide and maybe is even obligated to decide based on its constitutional mission, that depends on the jurisdiction, uh, some central questions of the political community, then it's not to say that, that it can do it in isolation from the broader uh, uh, society, if, if I manage to 
uh, answer the, the question. But it's a broad debate, which of course we can go to, to Schmidt, and there are lots of um, questions there as, uh, as well that arise. But that would be my, my take in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, uh, interesting debate. Uh, for Mr. Ria, is there any question, or maybe you have uh, what is that other argument? Yeah, I, I think I think this is a very interesting topic, and uh, honestly, I have lots of questions in my head. But I think it's 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 better to to give the chance to the others. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ria. Uh, next, I will uh, give the chance for our all participants. All participants, maybe you have a question or uh, you need more discussion about this topic. Please raise hand or just uh, mention on the chat. Is there any question? <clears throat> well, we can directly. Uh, Turn on your microphone to uh, asking a question. Is there any question or um, since uh, okay? It, uh, any question? Uh, oh, okay, uh, Mr. Emmanuel. Okay. Thank you uh, from the moderator, uh, Max. Uh, maybe I have uh, one question uh, in regards to with the previous questions. Uh, maybe uh, what is the limit of uh, for the constitutional court in exercising judicial activism? For the with uh, the pre uh, previous question. Thanks. So, so if I understand, okay. so just let me let me see whether I understand. So what is the limit of? Judicial activism of the constitutional court in a democratic society is that the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, uh, he, he mentioned also in this chat. Same. Yeah, I think. Uh, okay. Yes. It is an interesting topic about judicial uh, activism and also judicial restraint. Maybe you can uh, also uh, explain more about these two things. And it's debate. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, happy to happy to do that. Um, and uh, what I can try to do for this is I can maybe stop sharing my screen uh, here and share again the slide if I can find it, um, because this is one of those uh, those thorny issues associated with also the relationship between constitutional courts. Uh, and uh, and democracy. Okay, so how uh, do we think of, of judicial activism? And and I'm offering on the slides, you know, one just reproduction from existing literature uh, of understanding of judicial activism. So judicial activism may mean one of those five things um, that you know, Kin and Kmith and a uh, US scholar uh, argues: uh, striking down arguably constitutional actions of other branches, ignoring precedent, judicial legislation departures from accepted interpretive methodology and result-oriented judging. Okay, so these are some associations that are often linked to, you know, this is this is activist decision and the court strikes down something that is arguably constitutional, that a piece of legislation um, that should not have been struck down, that should have been upheld, that should have been considered as constitutional, right? Um, or the court is ignoring precedent, right? This is mainly in systems where there is a precedent-based uh, decision making. So in India there is uh, there is one, but uh, in Slovakia and I understand also on in Indonesia would be closest in the, this regard to Slovakia or Slovakia to Indonesia than Slovakia to India. Uh, this system of precedent would be would be weaker at least. Uh, we don't have uh, or or there is judicial legislation, right? So the court is overtaking the role of the parliament. It is enacting new uh, new. Laws. And in this context, I just thought to mention maybe this example because I was browsing the a website of the, the Constitutional Court of, of Indonesia, the English version only, unfortunately, it's the only one I can uh, understand. And there is, uh, on the 5th of April, there is a report in English, uh, deadline for resolving presidential election dispute in Constitutional Court law challenge. And I'm sure that um, some of you would be able to explain 
better to me, you know, what is going on in this uh, in this case. But what I understood from uh, the report is that, well, uh, there is a, a, a deadline, um, a, an issue of how long the Constitutional Court can take to give a decision. And this is essentially a constitutional uh, dispute. But there is also a question of, can a Constitutional Court rule uh, in this case um, on the basis of the competencies that it currently has? Or would the fact that it would decide uh, in this case, potentially it would decide that the current limit, the current deadline for it to decide is too short, um, would be uh, you know, um, unconstitutional, would it amount to something that, that is overstepping the court's competencies? So that is where the question of judicial activism to me could come up, right, in this particular uh, case. But again, I, I'm not familiar enough with the case to be able to comment in detail. I just read the press release on the, on the English language website. But it is just an illustration of these questions of judicial activism. What I would like to point out, and that would be my response to this, this question, is that if you actually think of each of these five criteria according to Kmitz, so or for that matter, other definitions of judicial activism, if you find some, there is no escape from interpretation. What is arguably constitutional? Right? What amounts to judicial legislation? What amounts to judges making policy? This is subject to controversy. This is subject to debate. This is subject to uh, disagreement. So it is very difficult then to actually say, you know, the court has been activist, has overstepped its competencies in this point or in that point, right? Because it is subject to debate. Now, there are some cases uh, where indeed you could find constitutional courts to be possible to be labeled activist because there is an overarching consensus um, and that could be a good indicator, a good sign. Look, this is a sign of activism that almost everybody agrees that this, this is too much, right? So this, the Constitutional Court should not have done. Again, from Slovakia, an, an example uh, where uh, the Constitutional Court has actually uh, refused uh, to even adjudicate on, on one important case pertaining to, uh, for that matter, the, the interpretation of the Constitution on the appointment of constitutional judges themselves. So this was a dispute pertaining to you know, how to uh, understand and interpret the mechanism for the appointment of constitutional judges. So the constitutional court was, in a sense, to decide about the appointment um, of its own uh, judges in a certain way, the mechanism of appointment of it. Um, and here the Constitutional Court has refused the petition altogether. But in fact, if we look at the reason that this would require, and this is what, what I'm what I'm suggesting to you to engage uh, uh, closely with the reasoning of the of the court, to take seriously what the court is trying to communicate through the reasoning of its decisions, also through its other communications, then we don't really find any arguments for the court not engaging at all in this case. And I would say that actually by refusing there to, to do anything, by refusing the case altogether, the court was activist because it overstepped its role, which was that it was tasked to provide an answer. It was tasked to provide a certain right? So that was paradoxically an activist decision, even though it was a refusal of the case, right? So the Constitutional Court didn't give an active interpretation. The Constitutional Court just said, no, we are not dealing with this, with this case. We are not in the position uh, to deal. Uh, with this case. And those maybe should be then the limits, right? So if there is an overarching consensus um, and, and lots of reasonable arguments given, that this particular decision uh, has uh, overstepped uh, the scope for the appropriate action of constitutional court, then maybe we can find some traces of activism. But generally, it's a very difficult concept to work with, and that is why I actually try to avoid it to the extent I I, I can uh, in in my work because it it tends to raise a lot of these um, these problems. Say, in, you know, how do we understand things? Like if you understand judicial activism differently from what I understand judicial activism to be, then we may not be able to effectively communicate on you know this claim. And judicial activism is one of those concepts which, for us, more than others, are are tricky in this regard. Okay, but this consensus, overarching consensus of the community about something to be activist may be a good sign to, to start with, if you want to engage uh, with, this, uh, with this concept. 
Okay, thank you for the explanation. It is so interesting. Uh, topic about judicial activism and faced with um, judicial restraint. Uh, how about uh, Mr. Emmanuel? Did you have any uh, feedback? Hmm? It's enough? Okay. Okay, I think it's an uh, insightful uh, explanation. But uh, because in Indonesian context, in our constitutional court, uh, our constitutional court has been um, examined many cases uh, about a judicial review, and uh, but uh, it's not only strike down the legislation, but also create a new norm uh, through their decision. It's it's so uh, it's a kind of um, judicial activism that uh, it has. Or um, does it mean that the judicial activism had deviated the uh, democracy. It's it's can be a debatable things. I think I know. Um, okay, but uh, for the next session, I think uh, maybe for a for all participants here uh, who will or who want to know more about uh, the constitutional court and the judicial activism and so on. Maybe is there any other question? session before we going to end it up. still have uh, around 30 minutes for Q&A session maybe. So for our participants, uh, is there any other question? Uh, perhaps just an, uh, an idea if it could uh, help if uh, because, uh, for example, I had recently, you know, I, I teach uh, in this semester in, in Slovakia, actually, and the other semester at the Indian University, and we had a, a guest session, and some of my students asked the questions in, in, in Slovak from an international uh, lecturer because, um, you know, it was a bit difficult to ask them in, in English, and I was translating them to, to English. So I would also be, you know, very open to this if someone would prefer to maybe ask in other language, which uh, maybe uh, the moderator could, could translate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that could also be. Uh, okay, if, yeah, okay. If participants want to uh, ask question in Bahasa, maybe I can uh, help to translate this uh, question. Uh, and I also notify to all uh, participants uh, participant to filling the participant attendance from uh, the form and uh, has mentioned in the chat. So did we have any question here? Okay, um, because uh, we have no other question, or maybe other participants still uh, feeling the the poll. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, this is we are going to the end of the session. Uh, but before we uh, gonna end the session, maybe you have a closing remarks uh, for for Max. If you have closing remarks, you can. Uh, and uh, you can mention or close this our discussion. But Penny, no. perhaps it's because of the uh, the Ramadan oh, month, oh. yeah. <laughs> and people are preparing to, <laughs> oh, yeah. to pre fasting. Yeah, Max. Uh, here in Indonesia, it's actually we are celebrating uh, Ramadan month. Uh, as a Muslims, most of us are fasting. And around this hour, usually people are preparing to 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 do the breakfasting. Uh, so probably that's also one factor. That's why it's a bit uh, a bit uh, what is it uh, passive here? Yeah. Please, please don't don't worry um, yeah, about it. I can understand, and I completely I, I do apologize that I had limited availability today uh, for for this uh, this talk. Maybe what I can do uh, if we have a, a couple of minutes. I can try to screen, uh, share again this screen with the with the question, um, 
and I think we have some results. We don't have many, but we have some some results. So what I can try to do? Can you see my screen now? Yes, we have. Yes. Yeah, so it's the question which which was there before. But what I would try to see is, you know, what are the results? So we have some responses here, and well, now you cannot, you know, vote anymore. I I think if if you are in the system. Um, but it was it's very interesting because out of you know those who have responded, fifty percent say democracy for them or the closest understanding of democracy from these ones on the screen um, is a political regime which respects the rule of law and fundamental rights. That's the that's the most uh, popular uh, option. Of course, it's probably not a representative uh, survey here, uh, but still, uh, it's more popular than democracy being the rule of the majority, the rule of the people, political regime characterized by regulatory and fair elections, um, or, or something else. And, you know, what I would wanted to just illustrate with this uh, question also is that essentially it's a reproduction of those three conceptions, the minimalist, the middle range, and the maximalist conception. Uh, of, of democracy, and I'm sure you know some of you have, have seen that. But um, if you think about the minimalist conception, well, that one would be associated with the rule of the majority, to some extent, the rule of the people or peoples. That one is complex; you could sort of link it to different uh, conceptions. But um, perhaps the rule of the majority would be more typically. Uh, and the other one, and that's the more Schumpeterian reading, um, regime characterized by free and fair elections. Right. So those those two would be more the minimalist reading. The political regime which respects the rule of law and fundamental rights, which was the most popular option, that one would be more the middle range, uh, right? So we are going beyond uh, majority rule, we are going beyond elections. And the one which no one has, has chosen from, well, those who have responded, uh, an order in committee to achieving political and social equality, that one would be the maximalist. So this is also a tool for you, possibly, to try to see how democracy is represented in various uh, areas of uh, of the public um, discourse, right? So how political leaders refer to democracy, what do they associate uh, with democracy, and ultimately also how constitutional court judges themselves refer to democracy in their case law uh, or, um, you know, in their public communications for that matter. Uh, Ryan kindly mentioned the Indonesian Constitutional Court International Symposium, which uh, is the forum where we uh, where we met uh, in person, where I had the, the pleasure to meet him. Uh, and this is one of those fora where some constitutional court judges from Indonesia and also sometimes other countries come in and they speak maybe in academic setting, uh, but they also speak about democracy. And there were some references also at this forum uh, on uh, on democracy, which were very interesting to, uh, to observe. So you can use this uh, to scrutinize also your well, political leaders, also other public actors, constitutional court judges, uh, on, on how do they refer uh, to, uh, to democracy. So this may be uh, uh, also some kind of uh, toolkit for, 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 for thinking about it, you know, uh, more uh, broadly. And if I uh, checked correctly, like um, uh, moderator, Mr. Penny Unita, you work on you know, misinformation in the context of, of elections. And there also um, we have, of course, references to, to democracy that may, uh, that may come up. So it could be interesting to see, for example, how democracy is related um, or is brought up um, in the context of fighting disinformation, fighting hoaxes. Uh, this is something that the European Commission, a key institution of the European Union, is very much associating democracy. It is, however, not associating democracy with the rule of law. That much. Okay. So this is also a way uh, how we can think more broadly, maybe, about those associations. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Max. And we are. I think we are going to the end of the station. Uh, thank you, Max, for your excellent discussion and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, I'm sure our audience has scanned a lot of valuable site uh, material from uh, you today. Uh, and for all participants, also, uh, I'm thank you for your attention and participation. We have uh, come to the end of our international public lecture about constitutional court and democracy. And uh, for our speaker today, thank you once again for your time and uh, your contribution to this event. Uh, let's give a big round of applause to Max Steyer. Okay, uh, see you on the next International Public Lecture and I will give back to the Master of Ceremony today. Thank you.
Thank you, Mbak Penny and Max. Finally, we reach the end of this session. Once again, I would like to thanks to the speaker as well as participants for this delightful afternoon. On the behalf of the committee, I would like to deliver to leave an apology for any shortcomings from this event. See you in the next inter international public lecture. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Daya, Salam Kewajikan. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Max. Uh, I hope that uh, we could have another uh, collaboration uh in the next future but the, in the thank near future yeah. <laughs> thank you so much uh and of course i would be glad to stay in touch or you know if anyone wants to contact me from among the students maybe with some questions uh, after the the session i have my email in the slides which you should have access to so feel free to just you know send me an email and i'm happy to connect with you to address any clarifications or you know, share with you some further reading materials if you don't have access to some of those further readings which I have suggested also uh, in the slides. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And, I will, and I, will, I will send you an email about the bit of paperwork <laughs> to do the administrative things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. <laughs>